Well, folks, welcome to one more edition of Politics and Random. Berto Will is your host, your host. You know, I'm reading Bruce's comment and it messes with my vocabulary. Who, your host? Howdy is what he says. Bruce Pollard, how are you doing? Bruce is in the house. Bridge MCP is in the house. Eric Hayes is in the house. Michael Rudnan, AVQ, is in the house. And uh, did I miss somebody yet? Where are all my peeps? Where are all my folks on YouTube? Where are all my folks on Twitch? Where is everybody? I know it's Friday, but, you know, well, anyhow, it's hot. Yes, Eric, it's hot. It's hot as hell. Replying, Bridge MCP, it is 100 to 103 degrees right now. It's kicking butt. Paul Fleming Sr. is in the house. Paul is going to be our next, as soon as I can get in touch with him to arrange a date, but our next, our next PDR Posse interview. So great, great, uh, great for taking that on, El Señor Paul Fleming Sr. Anyhow, folks, uh, let's see. Eric says, Ouch, just stay married. A new court filing from the estranged wife of Kevin Kustner is asking actor to provide $248,000 a month in child support for their three teenage children in a declaration filed on Friday to Santa Barbara County Superior Court and ob obtained by NBC News, a signed first-person declaration from Christine Baugartner states that she also wants Costner to contribute covering the cost of their kids' private school tuition, extracurriculars, and health care expensive. You mean $248,000 a month doesn't cover all of that? What am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? Wow. $18 million a year. You know, uh, when I talk about on, you know, pay that one doesn't deserve. Oh, my God. You know, uh, we need, you know, we, we I don't want to say pay one doesn't deserve. I'm talking about how uh, you have an economic system that works that. Well, it, it's a long convoluted mess in how you determine how to spread the wealth and how a system can be biased towards those with capital, including acting, et cetera. But it's going to be a hard sell because folks are so built into this system. Bruce says, esta es, viern esta es viernes y las gallinas van a la fiesta. Really? Are the chickens going to party? Wow. Okay. Uh, Costner is raking in 18 million is what Bridge says. Michael Rodney says, oh, whoa, wasn't paying attention to what's going on in Texas. The Weather Channel, Texas heat wave has smashed some all-time records and will expand into next week. It's going to be terrible. Nuclear family explosion. Eric Hayes says, Breed says, it, uh, Bar Gartner is fighting in the prenuptial agreement she signed ahead of their 20, 2004 wedding because she currently has no personal income and wants to maintain the lifestyle of their three children, sons, Caden, 16, Hayes, 14, and daughter, Grace, 13, are accustomed to. Oh, my gosh. They are accustomed to a certain kind of living. Wow. The bill titled the Middle Class Borrower Protection Act passed in the House, 230 to 189 vote, with 14 Democrats joining all Republicans in passing the measure. The legislation would cancel recent char uh, changes made by the Federal Housing Finance Agency to the upfront loan level pricing adjustment charged by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac for a guarantee of single-family mortgages. The act was introduced in the wake of significant outrage from Republican and housing experts alike who condemned the changes as socialists. Republican Majority Whip Tom Emmer, Republican Minnesota, an original co-sponsor of the bill lauded the bill's passage telling Fox Business, the Biden administration credit score redistribution plan is socialism at its finest. House Republicans stood up for hardworking Americans today by voting to eliminate this horrific rule and to ensure these with good credit are not forced to bankroll high. Guess what? The folks with bad credit are Republicans. The folks that don't have good credit are are Republicans. They just passed a bill. It won't get anywhere, of course, but they just passed a bill that's going to screw Republicans. I find it astounding. 
I find it astounding that Republicans hurt their own people. Republicans are poorer. The people in Republican states are poorer. The people in Republican states have worse credit ratings because, again, the credit score is based on how much you make. It's based on how much credit you have. And in those red states, there are a ton of people with no credit. So their scores are horrendous. This socialism was helping more Republicans per capita than Democrats are progressive, sir. You just screwed your own people. And what Democrats ought to do going forward is reminding Republicans who the bill screws in their, in their, in their fallacy, in their false belief that they are fiscally responsible. They pass a bill to screw most fiscally irresponsible people, which are their own. Sometimes I tell you, sometimes you wonder. You wonder. Michael Rodden said, Harry Truman has some words for the screen. Let's go ahead and put Harry Truman's words on the screen. I haven't seen it yet, but you know what? I will put it because if it comes from Rodden, it probably makes sense. Not it probably makes sense. I know it makes sense. Okay, here it goes onto the screen, and I will read it for our podcasters because most of the people who see this are going to see it on podcasts. It says the following. Socialism is a scare word they have hurled at every advance the people have made in the last 20 years. Socialism is what they call public power. Socialism is what they call social security. Socialism is what they call farm price supports. Socialism is what they call bank deposit insurance. Socialism is what they call the growth of free and independent labor organizations. Socialism is their name for almost anything that helps all the people, says Harry S. Truman. October 10th, 1952. And it continues. Thank you for that. But do remember, do remember that the bill that Republicans just passed that screws people with lower credit scores screws Republicans more than it screws Democrats. All right? Let's remember that. Okay, more justice like this tonight. On, I'm not reading that one. Michael says, what is socialism? I read that one already. Egberta, you may speak to yourself, but social stuff doesn't encourage debt score. Bring higher. It encourages gaining and using debt to live off of. I, as I repeat, you just screwed Republicans and you just cheered. Let me tell you what you just cheered. You just cheered screwing Republicans. There are people who have low credit rating, not because they're a bad credit risk, but because the way the credit is calculated Somebody who only makes a little bit of money and, and have other issues involved when the whole score is put together, screws you. All right. So Hayes just, remember this, Hayes just went ahead and, and he cheered a policy that screws more people on the right than it screws on the left. And he's happy about it. That is the funny thing about people who are uninformed. The funny thing about people who are uninformed is you'll have all those rednecks out there that, that I love, right? My redneck brothers and sisters in Appalachia, my redneck brothers and sisters all over the place, they're cheering, praise be to Donald Trump, praise be to Donald Trump, praise be to our people in Congress who are out there fighting for us. No, they're not. They're not fighting for you. They just screwed you. And one of your, one of your protégés just says, it's okay. And I'm going to come on a progressive show. And I'm going to show you. I am going to show you. I am going to show you. I'm going to show you what we just did. The people we love, what we just did to our own. We just screwed them. According to Michael Rodney and Egberto, uh, Republicans' policy agenda only has three planks. First, lower the taxes on the rich and the corporations so they pay what they uh, uh, so that they don't pay what they owe. Second, deregulation on the rich and their corporations so they can cheat taxes, price gouge, and pollute freely. Third, culture war attacks on anyone who isn't a white uh, white land owning cis male. Yes, how originalist 
it has red meat distraction from the two previously mentioned planks that are their agenda. R Bruce says, Eric, as you say, what a waste of time. Uh, Michael Rudnan says, you have to ask, what high crimes do Republicans think Joe Biden is guilty of? They don't have any. They don't have any. E2247 says, Egberto is doing great effort and great work today. He rested up for this visit. No, I'm excited because I'm here with you guys, brothers and sisters. Paul Fleming says, uh, uh, that's funny because Eric Hayes is the first to cry about the price of everything and cries about the price and he can't afford an electric car. He cries like a baby. And the funny thing about it is the people that are screwing him are those people that are in the Congress. Paul, uh, Eric says, no, pretty informed and my country friends are doing well. When you get uh, tax refunds, so do lower income people as they get every penny back. Wrong again. They pay taxes. They don't get it back. Those of us who make good money and pay even sales taxes, we get back some of it because we can deduct it. But sales taxes are regressive taxes, just like property taxes. And in that light, I'm going to play a 16-minute video that I did this morning on property taxes. Maybe some of you can be, maybe you will re-listen to it, Eric, because you were there this morning. Re-listen to it and be enlightened. But here it goes, ahora mismo, right now. Why tax policy experts fear, and this, this, is, this was keyed off of something I heard in passing. And then I went and did some research on it last night. And I said, you know, it, it's, it's, to me, it's a shame that there are a lot of subjects that we don't cover in detail that have material, that has a material effect on your personal economy that has a material effect on how much money you're going to spend, where you can live, et cetera. There are a lot of subjects like that that is just left to these guys in, uh, in Austin, in Washington, D.C., that we should have input in, but we don't. And as such, the only people that are listened to are those lobbyists who can go and advocate for a particular group of folks. And that is what you see with tax policy. With tax policy, we have in Texas, we don't have an income tax. And what we have is a property tax. And in having a property tax, we also have things like within that property tax, a homestead exemption, meaning a certain percentage of your property goes tax free. That helps people who, uh, you know, who are low income with a very low cost home. Uh, we also have some level of tax caps now, meaning your, your rate cannot go up. X percentage, I think it is currently at your tax rate, no matter what the value of your home is, cannot go up more than 10% in any particular year. So that, that, that is our tax policy uh, to run the state. We have a sales tax and we have a property tax. Mm -hmm. And both of those taxes are considered uh, regressive taxes, which means no matter how much you, uh, no matter what you make or whatever, your the value of your of your property is what's taxed, and that's static. That is something that is in in. If you take a look at how taxes work, that is one of the worst type of policies you can have for taxes. But let's go to the article. The, the article talks about what the debate is in Austin right now. And this is a part that I find concerning because the debate that's occurring in Austin, they, it's on grounds that to me makes no sense to the average homeowner, the average person paying these taxes, right? Remember what I said, whatever the taxes are based on whatever the cost of your home is. And I'll, I'll give you a, one of the biggest disadvantages of that subsequent to this part of the article. And it goes as follows. The article says, the question of how to cut taxes for Texas property owners sparked one of the biggest fights between state lawmakers this year. But when it's all said and done, either chamber's proposal would save the typical homeowner about the cost of a nice dinner date each month. I want you to think about that again. 
it'll save you about the cost of a dinner date every month. Still, the two options are hardly alike. They're hardly alike. While the Senate leader, uh, uh, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, advocates for an increase to the state's homestead exemption, homestead exemption meaning the, the amount of your, the value of your home that will not be taxable, House Speaker Dade Phelan put his chips on a proposal to limit how much property appraisal, a key figure in calculating a tax bill, can rise each year. Uh, the Bowman Republican wants to tighten the state's cap on annual increases to a home taxable value from 10% to 5%, meaning in any given year, even if your house appreciates 100%, the, the, the taxable portion of your home uh, could not be more than 5%. Let's give a, a classic example. Let's say your house is worth $100,000. And I'm using that number because it's, it's, it's a round number. But it, a homestead exemption, all of that, which it makes another value better. But let's use this as a round number. If your house doubles to uh, $20,000, uh, you cannot be taxed more the, the the tax rate of your house cannot go up as if two hundred thousand dollars is taxable, but only a hundred and ten thousand dollars is taxable because it can only your taxable rate can only go up by five percent. Okay, I mean by ten percent. So that's important and 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 that's that's sort of a good thing if you're going to have property taxes because. You know, uh, if your area gets gentrified, the, the, the value of your house could double in a few months because you could live in a shack in an area that people want to live. The land value alone may, may be several times the value of the house that you have. And it turns out then that you have you have a huge tax bill to pay. So uh, that is the the, 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 the guy, Dade Phil and the Speaker of the House, he wants to put caps on based on the increase in the value of your home, while Dan Patrick want to say, we increase the, the, the uh, homestead exemption of your house. If we ex increase the homestead exemption of your house, then you pay that much less taxes, okay? Both of them in the short term will save taxes. In the long term, it's a stranglehold once again on middle-class America. We'll go through that a little bit later, but tightening, tightening the appraisal cap would lead to all kinds of repercussions that have already played out in California, New York, and other parts of the country. Tax experts and critics of the proposal from across the political spectrum warn. They say placing a hard limit on how much appraisals can grow would create vast inequities between taxpayers, accelerate housing costs, and disproportionately benefit wealthy homeowners. That's what a cap does, is what uh, they're saying, right? Uh, even interest groups that represent the kind of business the cap is intended to benefit, including the Texas Association of Business and the Texas Association of Manufacturers, have come out against it, arguing that the proposal would create an uneven playing field that would benefit longtime business owners, never new ones. And let me explain what they mean. It would benefit longtime business owners. If you have, if you buy a business or a business, if you have a property and that property is assessed at 20,000, 20, to $200,000 this year, and next year is at $400,000, your tax rate with a 10% per year increase for that next year is only $220,000, 10% above the taxable amount, 10% above what it was before. However, however, that person who just bought that new property, in other words, another business owner. So let's say you own a pizza shop and the, the assessed property value is $200,000. The next year, you are only going to pay assessed value of $220,000. However, if a new pizza shop comes into your area and that same kind of building, same thing, 
But remember, its value is now $400,000. You are only assessed taxes of $220 as an old business there. But that new business that comes in is, is assessed a taxable value of $400,000 because that is what the property is. That's the market value of the property. That new business owner is at a disadvantage to that old business owner. But let's take it a bit further. Everybody cares about business, right? So the reason it's creating an issue is because these business entities, want old business and new business are fighting each other and that, hey, it's going to cost me more. I will be at a competitive disadvantage to the old business because my property assess taxes will be greater than that other business. So, so. That's creating an issue with caps right now. Notice nobody is talking about the homeowner, right? They're not talking about that same issue applies to the homeowner to some extent, right? Because the homeowner that's been there, their assessed value will simply be what based on their previous assessed values over and over and over again. While, while, as it turns out for the other, uh, for the, the new homeowner, their tax rate would be higher. Okay, now here is the other, uh, the, the other, the other thing. If you are built, if you have your own home, and this is where I talk about this is a horrendously terrible tax, property taxes. That is in this form. If you have a home, and I'm talking specifically for housing, etc. If you have a house, you don't have a lot of money, but you're a very resourceful person. You like to build things. So you have this $100,000 house and you add every now and then you get over, you, you, you're, you're in the construction industry. So as you're building other people's homes, there is leftover material and you bring that material to your home every day that you have some excess material. The owner of the home says, I don't need that material. Just take it with you, throw it away or whatever. And you bring all that material to your home. And with all that scrap material, you turn your $100,000 home into a mansion that's worth $500,000. But you're usual to an income that's only about $100,000 uh, a year. That's all the income that you make every year. And, uh, but you are so good with your hands. You create this magnificent home and this magnificent home is now valued at a half a million dollars because of your work. But it's in an, you know, but when, when they assess this value, you cannot hold on to this beautiful home that you make because you, that you made, because you can't afford the taxes, the, 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 property taxes, the new assessed value of the property taxes on that home. That is the type of issues that you have when the, your state depends on property taxes, on homes, etc., to raise cash. Because remember, everybody needs a home Everybody needs an apartment. If you're an apartment, the same things apply. You're a part of your rent is that apartment owner having to pay property taxes, right? So therefore, if you have, if, if we keep these different scenarios of property taxes, it turns out that those of us who have to have a home, who have to have live in property, that is, we are victims of having to pay these taxes, whether we can afford it or not, simply based on, on things many times we don't have control of. That person has control of adding to his home, which increases its value, but he doesn't necessarily have control of the value. In other words, he doesn't have control of how much more money he can make with, relative to that nice homes. He does not or he or she does not, but they will be penalized. They will be told you cannot have nice things because you don't, even if you build it yourself, because the income that you have doesn't warrant you having that nice house. It, these are things that 
Austin's not thinking about, but somebody living in the barrio or the ghetto or Appalachia who doesn't make a lot of money, but who are, is resourceful with their hands, who can build things, who can help their friends build things. The state is telling them, you are forever going to live in these conditions because that is what your income warrants. That is a penalty that you have with these types of property taxes. That is the reason why a progressive income tax, you know, a lot of people, when they hear, oh, in Texas, you're going to, we should have an income tax and people are way against it as if it's going to cost them more. The fact of the matter is if you have a progressive income tax that works to fulfill the needs of the budgetary, the, your, the budget of your state, it can be written in such a manner that it is based on your income. It has some, uh, some predictability. It doesn't follow the whims of the real estate market. It works in such a manner that helps you all. Texas, in my humble opinion, should get rid of property taxes on homes, should get rid of property taxes on cars, and should create property taxes on things like assets that are passive. Like what again? If you're invested in homes, if you're invested in stocks, if you're invested in these other entities, then those things should be taxable. Because again, those things are determinants of wealth. But when it comes to having a home, et cetera, you shouldn't have to pay taxes on that because, again, it, re- it, it changes the value. If you take a look at how our systems, our school systems are funded, et cetera, it, it, it creates a certain permanency if, of poverty, a certain permanency of given that you don't make a lot of money, you deserve to live a certain kind of a way. It is, it is not an egalitarian kind of a tax system. It is not a good tax system, in my humble opinion. I think an income tax makes a hell of a lot more sense because still, people who make a little income, no matter where they live, they can, in effect, uh, build on their own. So yes, folks, uh, the reality is property taxes on homes and cars, it's horrendous because it tells you that you can't improve on your property as much as you want to if you don't make enough money to warrant that. Uh, It's so, so important for us to learn these things so that we can fight the powers in Austin, the powers that listen to the businesses, et cetera, and don't listen to us, we, the people. But again, if you have sycophants out there who are constantly carrying the water for the rich guy, who's constantly carrying the water for those who are screwing them. Like, let's take a look at Eric. Eric just chaired a bill. This is, this is fantastic. Eric just chaired a bill that screws mostly, or not mostly, a larger percentage of Republicans than Democrats. It screwed low-income people. It, screw, it tells you that if you, uh, we, we create an arbitrary thing called a score. We create an arbitrary thing called a credit score. And supposedly, that credit score determines whether you are a good risk or not. But the people who have lost the most money in our country aren't the little people that mess up on their credit card or pay their credit cards late and all these issues. The people that have lost billions of dollars in one jive are the bankers who are supposed to know better, the investors who are supposed to know better, but they get a pass, right? They're not dependent on on some credit score or whatever, right? They've lost in one iteration a small number of investors and business people and bankers almost crashed the entire economy. Here we have a policy that sort of help out folks with, with credit scores, and it's the end of the world. But the bankers who almost destroyed the world's economy because they were nothing but parasites on the system, they stole money. They stole money with, with paper transactions. 
They get a pass. We don't want to. We don't want to create regulations to fix them. But let the little man get some sort of a benefit. It's the end of the world. That show that is slave mentality. That is the mind of a slave. I always pointed out, you know, when I I am so I am so thankful for the parents that I had or that I have I still have a mother. My father died. And the reason I'm so thankful is with all the tribulations that I would have to go through. And by the way, see that book on the screen, Tribulations of a, of a Black Afro-Latino Caribbean Man? With all the tribulations that I went through, they never taught me that I was a victim. They told me, don't be a, don't, don't, you could be victimized, but don't be a victim. So fight back, which is what I'm doing now for everybody else. I did my thing when I did my own corporation. I did my own things to do things, right? But I am so happy because I'm listening to some of my right-wing brothers and sisters. And I'm watching enslaved minds, right? I'm watching. And then I, it's something, I, I always remember a commercial I saw on TV. And that commercial said, a mind is a hard, a bad thing to waste. And then there are this, uh, this other commercial that showed, I no longer have to put the chains on your hands if I already have the chains in your mind. And what I watch, when I watch the right wing operate, it's like a whole bunch of people who need not uh, have chains. They don't have chains on, on their bodies. They just have it in their minds. This morning, I read a medium, a medium article. And the medium article said she accidentally got into the right wing uh, mailing list. And she said it was the most fearsome thing because the list makes everybody in the, uh, the right wing a victim and that everybody is under attack. And, that, uh, and she said it's amazing to see how capitalism is used to destroy these people's lives. They have them buying guns. They have them buying material, uh, food to store for the next, the next uh, civil war. They have them buying gold bars. They have them buying all these things. She said, I got on the list, Egberto. No, she wasn't speaking to me. She was speaking to the, the medium audience. She got on the list and she started to talk about all the scary things that these right-wingers have to endure by email, by radio, by right-wing radio, by AM radio. It's go, go ahead and buy the food. Go ahead and buy the, the protection, your, your, your uh, body shields. Go ahead and buy your guns. Go ahead and remember, it's, she said there's even one for vacationing. How to vacation when you have to pass through a blue state? Huh? Are you kidding me? Anyhow, Chris Christie went out there to the freedom, to the uh, freedom, uh, what is it called? Something of freedom. He got booed for telling the truth. And what did he get? Here we go. I want to play this one for you. I think you guys are going to find this quite enlightening. He's let us down. He has let us down because he's unwilling. He's unwilling to take responsibility for any of the mistakes that were made. Any, uh, any of the faults that he has and any of the things that he's done. And that is not leadership, everybody. That is a failure of leadership. And I, you can boo all you want. So Christy just got booed for telling the truth. All right. Egberto from Bridge MCP. Egberto. A mind is a terrible thing to waste. Background, this has been the slogan for the United Negro College Fund since 1972. The UNCF, also uh, known as United Fund, was incorporated in 1944 by Frederick D. Part uh, Patterson, then president of what's known as the Tuskegee University. It is an American philanthropic organization that funds scholarships for black students and general scholarships funds for 37 private historically black colleges and universities in 2005. UNCF supports approximately 65,000 students of over 900 colleges and universities with approximately $113 million in grants and scholarships. And what else have we got here? About 60% of these students were the first in their families to attend college and 62% uh, annual families' incomes of less than $25,000. UNCF also administers over 450 named scholarships. 
Robert Davenport, yoo-hoo, thank you so kindly. He says, greetings, progressives. Buy Egberto's book, Knowledge is Power. I am so enthralled. Thank you so kindly, Roberto Davenport, Robert Davenport, for your kind super chat. Folks, please join Robert Davenport if you have the wherewithal to throw us a super chat. And by the way, you can also just join, right? You can join join our, our PDR Posse on YouTube. If you're on YouTube, just click that join button. Thank you so kindly for that. I got another video for you guys. This one here is... Uh, you know, they're, they're, they're trying to get expunged the impeachment of Donald Trump. Uh, they want Donald Trump to be, to be and, and, and to do so, you had McCarthy lying to a reporter who caught him red-handed and, and, and pointed it out immediately. The only sad thing about it is as this reporter challenged him, I saw all the other reporting sycophants around not really saying, yes. The reporter's right. Why are you lying to the American people? Let's check that out. And you're going to uh, we'll take it on the other side. There's a talk among Republicans about expunging Donald Trump's impeachment. What can you tell us about that? And what has Kevin McCarthy said about it? Yeah, this is interesting. This is an idea that came from Elise Stefanik. It's been embraced by some of the kind of more MAGA members of the Republican conference, including Marjorie Taylor Greene. The idea would be basically passing a resolution to, they say, expunge uh, these two impeachments of Donald Trump. Uh, through some great research by our in-house historian, Kyle Stewart, our view on this on the NBC Hill team is that this isn't really a thing. It's the idea here is basically a non-binding resolution saying this thing that happened didn't happen. And you can't functionally remove an impeachment that was voted on, that went to a trial, uh, that was done. Although it does seem like this idea is gaining some support nonetheless. Uh, Kevin McCarthy was asked about it a little while ago. We got down quite a rabbit hole going back and forth on whether he would support this idea. Here's some of what he said to my colleagues and I. Now we find out with Durham and the others that um, the impeachment never should happen. We find... In what way happen. does Durham indicate the impeachment shouldn't have happened? Exactly, exactly what he said. He said they shouldn't have gone forward with it based upon the information that they had because the information wasn't true. He wasn't impeached on anything related to Durham. He was impeached on the Ukraine. He was impeached on January 6th. It has nothing to do with Durham. Now, 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 calm down. He started at the very beginning. We went a couple rounds on this, Katie. The upshot here is that the speaker said he supports this idea in theory, but it doesn't sound like it's the kind of thing he's going to rush to the floor. He suggested it would go through committee and that our priorities were out of whack in the press corps for asking about this. As I pointed out to him, there is nothing in the Durham report or in his five hours of testimony from earlier this week that suggests Donald Trump should not have been impeached either on the Ukraine matter or certainly on January 6th, both of which he was impeached by the House of Representatives. Okay. Now, here's the deal. Garrett Hake, Garrett Hake, a Texan. Good job. I want to commend. Look, there are times that these reporters just say he said so, she said so. What Garrett Hake did there is extraordinarily important. He challenged the lie. He challenged the lie in real time as it occurred. Too many reporters are just saying, just in front of the, the politician, allow him to s expunge the lie, put out the lie, and then they'll go into the studio and say, yeah, he said that, but in reality, you know what really happened? Well, no. Garrett Haig, at that point, at that moment, did the right thing as he went ahead and he pointed out, no, sir, you are lying. You are a liar. That is not what... That is not what the special counsel uh, said at all. Durham didn't say that. Durham, in fact, what he was covering had nothing to do with the impeachment. Donald Trump was impeached for being an insurrectionist on January 6th. January Alt-P was in, in impeached for attempting to bribe a foreign governor, a, a foreign leader, in order to get the supplies, the, the military supplies that had already been given to him by the United States Congress. Let's get that right. Do not allow them to conflate these things. And kudos to Mr. Hake. Kudos. I really want to him to get these kudos because that is what we need them doing. Anyhow, last video of the day is about... 
uh, the Democrats need to heed this message. Demographics is not going to save Democrats. I repeat, demographics will not save Democrats. Don't think you have the Latino vote. Don't think you have Lee Grant. My brother Lee Grant says, keep free speech alive. You're absolutely right about keeping free speech alive, brother Lee Grant. And, uh, you know, when, when Lee Grant, who is a supporter of Politics Done Right, supports us, it touches my heart because one of because again when everybody gives it touches my heart but there's something special that i know robert who is a great supporter and 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 bridge mcp who is a great supporter and many of you who are great supporters i want to live in a society where somebody who often disagrees with me like brother grant continues to be a supporter because he believes in free speech. But I'm going to tell you something else that he will never admit. He likes me. And not only does he like me, you remember when, when Sally Field went and said, they like me. No, what I, mean, what I mean about this with Brother Grant is that I think he wants to hear the other side. I think Brother Grant's want, Grant wants to hear the other side. Thank you, Brother Grant. Anyhow, continuing. Let, let me set this up again. Many Democrats think that because, you know, Texas is a majority Latino state right now. Many Democrats believe that anytime you have Latinos in power, you know, in, in the majority, whenever you have minorities in, in, that make up a plurality or a majority, that somehow that, is, it, that means they are likely to get the vote. They could not be more wrong. And I can tell you this not from reading books. Or reading articles during the canvassing time during elections, I do canvass in Latino areas. For Bernie Sanders, I canvassed in Las Vegas in Latino communities at Latino grocery stores, etc. Uh, in during the last election, I, I went into um, I don't remember what ward here in Houston to go ahead and do that. Bridge MCP, thank you so kindly for your for your. Support, she says, I may not agree with all right people say, but I would would stop in the rain, uh, I, but I would stop in the rain to change a flat for them. I believe they're good people, as I hope they will about me. And you know what? Yes, the answer is yes. I've been to all kinds of uh, areas where people eventually knew that I am this liber this progressive dude and we still break bread together at my 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 uh my starbucks they all know who i am and we break bread together so continuing with the with the notion of latino votes thank you very much bridge mcp continue with the issue with the latino vote the latino vote does not belong to democrats the black vote does not belong to democrats you have to earn the vote irrespective if you want people to vote for you earn the vote don't listen to those ivory tower guys in washington who are telling you demographics is the answer and why these are the way to do things and you know what today uh msnbc had a an analyst a, a latino analyst who knows exactly the reality of what we're talking about here i want you to listen to this and then we'll take it on the other side Analysts say Democrats need to do even more if they want to win the 2024 election. The Koch Political Report highlights a study that analyzes Latino voter trends in key battleground states. Amy, Amy Walter writes, quote, it paints a worrisome picture for Democrats who may be hoping that increased Latino turnout in 2024 will cement their gains in key battleground states. For years, the working assumption among many campaign professionals was that Latino voters stayed home in midterm elections, but showed up in presidential elections. As such, a district or county with a significant Latino population would perform much better for Democrats in a presidential year than a midterm. But Republican candidates can make significant inroads with these voters, especially if they put a full court persuasion press on them while Democrats only engage these voters at the very end of the campaign. 
Joining us now, Communications Director of the Libre Initiative, a national advocacy group for Latino Americans. Wadi Gaitan, thank you so much for being on. So what is the state of Latino support for Democrats? Are, are, are Democrats losing Latino voters? Uh, yes, they definitely are. I mean, the reality is I think many Democrats thought that that uh, voting demographic was baked in in their favor. And what we're seeing is actually that more Latinos are actually identifying as independent, as a swing voters. They're really willing to hear from both parties. Uh, it's important for Democrats to understand that this is a loss in the sense that before they could sort of count at these voters and these universes as sort of a get out the vote uh, demographic that yeah. towards the end of the election, they could just make that call and they would show up. But the reality is that is not the case. They're going to have to court the vote and they're going to have to work hard for it. So sort of give me a snapshot of the mindset here of uh, the Latino voters who are um, deciding that they're going to be independents or may not vote Democrat. In that mindset, what are the issues that are drawing them away from the Democratic Party? Yeah, I would say it's a, it's a couple of issues. But one thing when, when you, when you talk to Latinos across the country, when you look at the polls, one of the biggest things is the economy. Inflation specifically has created a barrier towards the American dreams for Latinos. The American dream is more expensive for them. So they want to hear what are the policies? What has the president done? And what is he going to promise to actually do when it comes to the topic of uh, the economy? Uh, a lot of the polls also show that in, in general, Latinos view uh, their trust towards Democrats as being the party that can actually deliver on the economy, that can deliver on issues like crime and like public safety is lower than the trust that they have uh, for Democrats. That doesn't mean that Republicans don't have barriers on their end, but these are also the barriers uh, that Democrats are facing when it comes to courting that issue. Also, when it comes to immigration, Democrats have made the right promises, but have not been able to deliver on those, process, on those promises for various reasons. But Latinos now view this topic as not not necessarily the party uh, that is going to be able to deliver. So they're not just looking for the promises. They're looking for results on the topic of immigration. So, Wadi, obviously, the Latino vote, not monolithic, uh, different people, whether they're country of origin or where they live in the United States changes your viewpoints. But let's just focus on one state in particular real quick. It's Florida, which yeah. has trended away from Democrats uh, in recent cycles. This idea that the anti-socialism argument the Republicans are putting forth has been successful. Do you see anything that could push Florida back towards the blue column? Or do you think it's pretty safely read right now? I think it's safely read, but Republicans have made a lot of work in that area. So if Democrats genuinely want to win over Hispanics across Florida, they're going to have to have a strategic targeted approach. Right now, you're talking about uh, that there's the distinct backgrounds, right? Uh, Orlando specifically, the amount of Puerto Ricans who have moved there in the last four to five years from the island, even individuals from areas from New York who have moved to Orlando, have to understand that this demographic is completely different than the Cuban population, Venezuelan and Colombian uh, in Miami, also in areas of South Florida, there is a grow in Mexican population in the areas like Homestead. So not only is it coming to these groups, showing up early, but it's making the specific case of why these different groups uh, should vote for them. Something that Democrats really have to do is go beyond, again, that traditional uh, four-year voter that only votes in presidential races. Uh, there's approximately a million Latinos uh, who are, are, are turning 18 every year. That's projected to be for the next 15 years. Th these are U.S. born Latinos. These are people who can register to vote. The case has to be made to them early on why these folks aren't necessarily registering again as Democrat or Republican. Their party uh, affiliation isn't their identity. They're going as independent. The case has to be made. And Florida is very unique because Republicans have made uh, a lot of uh, headway and they've had the results to show for it. Okay. Uh, I, I, so it, as it turns out, it is imperative if Democrats want the Latino vote, that they work for it, get out of the ivory towers. Who makes you believe you know what the Latino vote is all about? Most of the times, they don't. Another thing here, Carl Cox nails it. When Carl Cox says, Democrats in ivory tower will lose again and again if they continue to ignore both minority voters and progressive voters. Breed says, 
Egberto, how come they constantly uh, speak of the issue yet do nothing? Because again, it's easy to talk about something. It's hard to go into the community and work the community. When we went out there canvassing the community, people were, uh, as you know, I, I did most of the Spanish speaking in, in these communities. And what you found is that people were, first of all, apprehensive. They didn't want to get into the into the um into the electoral system because again they were they were distressed they they felt alienated and also they were scared they you know most families a lot of latino families in some of these poorer areas are mixed families meaning half of them or some of them are 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 are, are american citizens some of them are green card holders and some of them are undocumented right it's a it's a it's a combination thereof and you know the, then then there's another thing about uh, latinos as well Latinos uh, uh, suffer the same disease that many minorities have in, in attempting to move up forward. They look at, the, some get ahead and they look at those behind them as a problem because they hate that people are viewing them through the eyes of the new immigrants. It, it's, a, it's a very complex dynamic. In fact, I have a, I speak to a lot of folks that I go around the, 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 my town and I talked to some of the guys that are cutting the grass or whatever. And one of the guys who had a crew, but he was undocumented, he looked at me and he said, you know something, Egberto? Um, I, I, you know, you actually stopped by and talked to us and, and all of that as we were speaking in Spanish. He said, the truth of the matter is the people that, that hurts us the most are some of our own Latinos who, number one. So, I mean, there, there's a message from Brother uh, the Duck that quacks that says, you mean Latinos support cages for their relatives? No, they don't support cages for their relatives, but they don't mind the relatives of others in cages. Many times that's what you find. And uh, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex dynamic that is self-hate, not wanting to be judged by the lesser of you, meaning the ones who have just got here or the ones who are not yet fully successful. The dynamics is amazing, and the Republicans, as usual, know exactly how to expand or uh, extort that, not extort, um, exploit that dynamic. But it, it goes a bit further. When you go to Spanish AM radio or, or Spanish radio, there's a lot of lies that you'd hear from the right wing on these radio stations. And I would be listening to it, and I'm like, how comes our Democratic Latino uh, Latino folks who understand what's going on on this radio aren't in their communities a lot making mention of all this stuff. They don't. They're not doing the footwork. Texas would be a blue state if folks did the footwork. If folks did the footwork, we'll be a democratic state. I'll Senor Robert Davenport says, Republican talk about issues, but they are lying about wanting to address issues for the good of the people of this country. Corporate uh, double speak is their stock and trade, and they know how to do it very well. And by the way, brother um, Davenport, we have a small sect known as the uh, neoliberal Democrats by Act that 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 actually binds. In fact, if you take a look at the Obamacare, the reason we didn't get the um, the the uh, public option, which would have done marvelous things for the insurance agencies, which means would have ultimately destroyed the insurance agencies that that overcharge. We never got that. That's all these things that cause these particular issues. So it's a complex thing that we are here to talk about, that we are here to do something about. If you If you have friends in Latino neighborhoods, make sure they hear this story. Make sure everybody hear this story. And with respect to, let's see, Bridge MCP said Texas is going purple like North Carolina. Wait for it. Yeah, it's going to be faster than people think. Uh, Eric says Texas is not a blue state. Uh, go to one of that is what you want. No, 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 no. Texas is a blue state. Most of the people want progressive ideas. That's a blue state. All right. Let's, uh, let's uh, remember, folks, to please support the show. If you are on YouTube... Go ahead and click that join button. Become a part of our PDR Posse from YouTube. Alternatively, you can go ahead and support us via PayPal, politicsdoneright.com slash PayPal, politicsdoneright.com slash PayPal. Alternatively, we need patrons, patrons, patrones. Please join via Patreon to our, to our program. You can go to politicsdoneright.com slash Patreon. Patreon is spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N, P-A-T-R-E-O-N, politicsdoneright.com 
So that's Patreon. Exactly right. Robert Davenport says, Joe Lieberman stopped the public option. Exactly right. It wasn't a Republican. It was a neoliberal Democrat who now is working with no labels to try to get Biden out of office. Uh, Michael Rodden says, Egberto, the difference between the people wanting progressive ideas and the people actually voting progressive is the difference of propaganda as well as the difference between purple and blue. You nailed it. I've got such smart, uh, such a smart audience. For those of you who uh, want to support us, again, w- uh, there is a catch-all. PoliticsDoneRight.com slash support. Brother E2247 says, Policy Planning Staff Memorandum, Source National Archive. Thank you very much for that, sir. Uh, I, I didn't get the previous message to that. So please throw it again so that others will see it. Uh, the duck that quacks us saw a 65-year-old postal employee died in Texas yesterday from the heat. Yes, he did. Um, uh, let's see. The last way to support, remember, I'm heading off to, uh, to Chicago in about two and a half, three weeks uh, to support, to, to go ahead. And, uh, and we're, we're talking about policies, et cetera. Well, I'll be there on Radio Road this time. I won't be going to a whole lot of conferences. I, you know, I'll be there trying to get some interviews, et cetera. I usually get between 25 and 50, depending on the, the, the group that's there. I'm hoping to get about 50 interviews in this time around. Please support us. I, I finally got it up and running again. It had expired, so I had to re- restart it again. That is politicsunright.com slash netroots. I'm looking for it right now. Politicsunright.com slash netroots. Uh, here it is. And let me go ahead and click on it to give you all the options that you have. I'm going to put that on the screen as well. Those of you who support us uh, by giving at least $35 will get a, a, polit- a, a, as I see it, not as I see it, it's worth it how to talk to your right-wing relative, friends, and neighbors, as well as a bumper sticker. Uh, you will also, everybody who donates to, to uh, my trip to uh, Chicago, everybody will be listed as producer, supporter of every video that I put out there. Every video that I put out there will list you as a supporter, as a producer. The persons who give uh, $35 will get It's Worth It How to Talk to Your Right Wing Relative Friends and Neighbors with a bumper sticker. Uh, those who give $100 will also get a web page of your design, as long as it's it's legal, not not anything pornographic, etc., at our politicsandright.com website. And those who give $200 or more, and by the way, every time you get to a different tier, you get everything that the other people get. Those who give $200 would also get a, what again? A polo shirt with our Politics Done Right logo on it. Uh, w- what am I using this for? I'm using this to get, I, I want to get a, a, a new mic, transportation, lodging, etc., etc., etc. We are a very frugal operation here. As you can see, I do just about everything by myself. This time around, I think brother, uh, brother um, Bruce Pollard is going to be there to kind of, when if I need to run somewhere or whatever, to hold down the fort a bit. But anyway, what you see on the screen is what you have, and, and you just simply have to click that donate button. And when you click that donate button, you have the option to provide us with whatever you can to support what we are doing. Anyway, I got to get out of here. My name is Egberto Willis. I thank you so kindly for being here. I thank you so kindly for your support. My name is Egberto Willis. This is Politics and Right, and you know how I end this, baby. I am what? Out. We spend a lot of time deconstructing the news, trying to trying to parse it into a form that everybody can understand. We try to find those little nitpicks where uh, it goes, it flies above the fray, etc. If you really like these videos that we do, I want to ask a big favor. Please go ahead, number one, subscribe to our channel, and number two, please join if you can. Thank you so kindly for watching. Keep watching. Please remember to share. We must populate the entire internet with our progressive message, a message that we know is what most Americans say that they want. So help us please join.